begin to wrap it up with two items from the corrective lens this week from the school chapter. First one, higher education in particular should recognize that civilization needs citizens capable of openness and inquiry. These should therefore be the hallmarks of higher ed. The need for nimble thinking, creativity in both the posing of questions and the search for their solutions, and ability to return to first principles rather than rely on mnemonics and received wisdom. These are ever more important as we move forward in the 21st century. A misunderstanding of how work will look in the future is driving people to specialize earlier and more narrowly. Higher ed is the natural place to counteract that trend and push toward greater breadth, nuance, integration. Students of traditional college age today cannot accurately predict what their career will look like by the time they are 70, 50, or even 30. College is where breadth should be inculcated. And um, so again, higher education in particular should recognize that authority is not to be used as a bludgeon to shut down the exchange of ideas. Bob Trivers, evolutionary biologist par excellence and our mentor in college, once advised us to seek positions in which we taught undergraduates. His reasoning was this, undergrads do not yet know the field and so are likely to ask questions that you aren't expecting, dumb questions if you will, or ones imagined to already be settled. When the educator is confronted with such questions, one of three things is likely to be true. One, sometimes the field is right and the answer is simple, full stop. Two, Sometimes the field is right, but the answer is complex, nuanced, or subtle. Figuring out or remembering how to explain that complexity or subtlety is worth the time of any thinker who deserves the title. And three, sometimes the field is wrong, and the answer is not understood, but it takes a naive view of the matter to ask the question. Yeah, it's so true. You lose the ability to see the question. And uh, when, you're, when you're immersed in it and, you know, any, anyone who's taught at all, you know, it, do, it doesn't require being sort of, you know, a, a, a deep, a researcher into something very deep, but anyone who's taught can see themselves moving farther and farther from the minds of their students, the longer they do it, the, the, you know, the, you know, how was it to be naive, naive in like an open, wonderful sense, not in a, you know, an ignorant sense, but like, what was that? And how can I maintain my theory of mind and understand what it's like to be in the heads of these people in front of me so that I can best reach them and communicate with them and they can reach me and communicate with me. Right. right. And the, you know, the uh, ungrooved mind asks questions aplenty that aren't so useful, but in it's, it's very much of the question of the fringe, right? Mm -hmm. The fringe is mostly wrong. But within that sea of wrongness, there are the hints of the next frontier. And the the ungrooved mind doesn't know which of their questions are the good ones necessarily. But the so point I, is... You're ungrooved. I've never heard this, this. Well, if you become, you know, if you become expert in... Let's take the this example. Our colleagues do not understand that the waiting time problem in evolutionary biology is actually real because it was delivered in a sea of not very good critiques that came from intelligent design folks. But the point is, it's actually a good question. Is there enough time for the process that you know to have explained the adaptations that you see and claim have been produced by it, mm -hmm. right? And if the answer is no, it doesn't necessarily imply what the people who ask the question think it implies. It implies maybe you're looking for another layer of process, mm -hmm. right? And so anyway, the point is the grooved minds are so used to saying, here's the process that explains it. So by groove, so I'm just, I'm hung up on this grooved versus ungrooved. It sounds like it, it could, for me, as someone who's done comparative anatomy, I'm thinking like, you know, the, the more, the more actual grooves in brains, the higher the cognitive capacity. And I don't think that's what you're meaning to imply at no, all. No, I mean grooved as in- Like canalized. Like yes, canalized. Okay. Right. Okay. Which the point is, if you're very excellent at something, it has a lot to do with following those grooves because they lead to useful places rather than to spinning your wheels. So but, you want it. So, okay, I know I need to get to this point that's eight steps down and I'm not going to every time spend time I'm making the first five decisions because I just already know where I have to go in the decision tree. As right. It were. Which is what Trivers was telling us yes. was that you need somebody who is naive in order to help you see where you've actually made a cognitive choice that you don't realize is a choice because you make it every time. Mm -hmm. Right. Um, similarly, I would just add that uh, the there's a parallel experience to the one I described at first where somebody in the class 
is willing to push back because they just can't stand to hear you say something that isn't right. And then once they do it and it turns out that they get praised for it rather than get scolded, other people want in on the game and suddenly you've got a whole class full of people pushing back on you and each other and it's very vibrant. There's this other thing. The flip side is... You can, so it requires a teacher, a professor, who knows that what they think they know might not be true and is willing to say in front of the class, oh, uh, yeah, that's probably right. Actually, I, th I had that wrong. Or, mm, I don't think so. And then come back the next day, the next week, whatever it is, and say, yep, you, you, know, you were right. I was wrong. Right. Or you can do it intentionally. And so the point is you can drop something in. Right. You, you, can, do, you can do it intentionally, but you, you would not. No one would do that if they weren't comfortable doing what I just right. said. Because, exactly. because And, and yeah. you know, we've, we've known too many of these people who are like, well, I can't go there because then they're going to start pushing back over on what is my domain and I can't take pushback in my domain. Yeah, we know. And that's, that's unfortunately a big part of the problem. And it's not that there aren't plenty of people who are capable out there, but um, if they fear being revealed as incapable of some part of what they claim is central to their to their you know their depth, um, that that will basically you know the entire thing will, will turn out to have been a Potemkin University or something. Yes, they they yeah. rig their whole teaching lives around not being exposed for their own yeah. uh, limits. And you know, yes, that's a terrible teacher. You yeah. insecure teachers is, is a, a hazard to to your ability to think. Um, but anyway, the, the thing I wanted to point out was there's the encouraging the student to push back because all of the rewards come from them actually spotting things that don't yet add up and figuring out what's in those gaps and all of that. And then there's the, the detection that a student is being socially motivated, which is bad, mm -hmm. right? Now, most teachers use social mot motivation to get mm -hmm. students to accomplish stuff, even good teachers, right? Um, but the problem is there's a limit to that. To the extent that somebody is very plugged into what the social authority is telling them to do, it depends on it being a good authority. Otherwise, it's just a mechanism to be manipulated into nonsense. And so the other thing I would do, which you saw me do many times, was when I detected that somebody was trying to tell me what they thought I wanted to hear in order to get a pat on the head, right, I would lead them down a logical chain, right, to some place that was dead wrong. And then I would basically cut off the limb behind them so that they would get the experience of like, oh, yeah, trying to tell this person what they want to hear is actually not the road somewhere. It's actually the road to not knowing where you are and being a little bit embarrassed. And, um, and but then, you know, you've got this great lesson, which is, okay, if I just led you six steps down something to something we all know is false, mm -hmm. and you agreed with every step along the way, where was your error? It's crazy to me how much you enjoy this. <laughs> well, that's the thing is, I mean, you know, you, you will agree. I was not hated by my students. So it not wasn't me, like no, they, it wasn't all. like. No, it, did, it, did, it didn't work this. for absolutely everyone, but it was pretty clear right away. That those, those relatively few people for whom it, this wouldn't work. And um, no, not the, the, quite, quite the opposite. Um, and that's not, um, that, what I just said has nothing to do with, um, with yeah, anything on their end, just that, um, some, you know, I did, I did a lot of things that you never did. And you did a number of things in the classroom that I never did. And some of those things that you did, I would watch and go, I, I see that that is effective and that no one else is doing it. And I just could not bear to do what he is doing. I, I, I couldn't. All right. So here, here's one for you. A um, couple of weeks ago, I got a communication from a former student, mm -hmm. somebody who had actually given me a lot of trouble, right? And was not... When when you when you were in professional relationship with one another, when, yeah. when you were this his is or her somebody, professor. This yeah. is somebody who did not quite get what the style of teaching was about. It was the yeah. rare, exceptional yeah. person, highly intelligent, but didn't dig it and said so. And anyway, yeah. I mean, that was actually, that, that could, that happened. Sometimes it was interesting. Right? Yeah. Yeah. Anyway, she contacted me and she yeah. said, by the way, first of all, she asked if I remembered who she was. Of course, I remember who she was. You were total, we were thorns <laughs> in each other's sides. Right. right exactly. <laughs> um, but, uh, and I'm not going to use your name because I didn't yeah. check it with her. But, um, anyway, if you're out there, you know who you are, you have an unusual name. <laughs> and uh, she said, you know, I just wanted to tell you that I don't think I was ready for those lessons, but um, I now get what you were up to. And uh, I really appreciate what you were doing. So 
Anyway, even in the cases where it didn't oh, necessarily yeah. work, I think there's um, well, there's the ability to 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 see what its its point is. And I mean, this too. This this is one of the things that um, that I I don't actually see a way around this, but that modern education is limited in that the assessment happens too soon, right? Mm -hmm. um, that the assessment both by faculty of students and by students of faculty happens when you're still just in the thick of it. And, you know, maybe, you know, maybe your professor managed to game it such that your last week was an incredible amount of fun and you feel like you learned a lot. And so you're going to write this glowing evaluation and maybe they weren't thinking about it. And so their evaluations are more variable, even though they actually, you know, a year on five years, 10 years, 20 years on, you realize, oh, that's the person I learned from. Why did I write that sort of mediocre evaluation of them? Oh, because they didn't, you know, game it so that my, I was feeling full of dopamine at the point that I wrote the thing. And the same, same thing for faculty writing evaluations of students. Um, and, you know, I used to say, actually, especially after the study abroad um, programs, you know, okay, you know, final, final thing is not a science thing, but um, I just want, you know, a short essay on some aspect of this, be it, you know, five and a half, eight week, 11 week, whatever it was, um, expedition through either Panama or Ecuador, um, that you that you were surprised by and that you can analyze in some depth. And I would invite people to write me another one in a year and two years and three years and say, you know, I'm not, I, I won't, I, I won't be in this relationship with you then. You are under no obligation and, and um, I'm right. of course under no obligation to read it, but I'm telling you I will. Anyone who sends me these a year on, two years on, three years on, reflection about this thing that we just did that I created on your behalf and on my behalf and on our behalf and that I allowed a lot of serendipity to happen so that I couldn't predict everything that would happen or all the lessons learned. I would love to see those. Um, and there are a couple there are a couple of people who, um, who do send me um, yep. who send me those you know, years, many years later. And it's amazing because, you know, the idea of assessment when you're still in the thick of the thing that you're supposed to have learned imagines again that learning that, you know, that that the short time horizon is where it's at. And it's not. Well, there, there not. are three things there. One, it reflects what you said up top about I'm not your employee, you're not mine. Yeah. There are superficial resemblances between this relationship and that, but that's not what this is. And to right. the extent that anybody would take seriously your assignment that gets turned in at their discretion years after any relationship, any formal relationship at all exists, the point is, well, actually, you as the professor were trying to create an experience that was meaningful enough that years later, it would still be on your mind. And that's, of course, what you should be doing. Right. Um, and the fact that, uh, you know, you and I know, if you've been in the field with students, right, you've been suffering with them, you've been, you know, shocked alongside them, right? You've seen amazing things together, right? You know, it's obviously the experience is one off for each of us, but there's so much that gets that's in that relationship that doesn't get quantified, that doesn't get evaluated. And of course it builds this connection that years later they want to tell you, you know what that actually meant to me? You know, yeah. what it meant to me, I didn't get for three years. Right. Right. And then finally it dawned on me. Mm -hmm. And of course the idea that you're important enough to them that they would think to tell you, right, is a demonstration that this, this actually did live up to what the experience was supposed to be. It wasn't encapsulated in any way. And that's what, you know, the, the all too common and pat phrase now, you know, lifelong learners, right? Yeah. But that's, there's honor in that. That's what we all should seek to be. And uh, an educational system that is functional uh, should inculcate that desire in people who are currently called students and may later be called teachers or carpenters or scientists or whatever it is that they're they're called um, and they should want to both continue to learn and yes it's deeply human to want to share with those who helped create the experiences in which they learned the thing uh, what it is they learned yeah and uh, yeah unfortunately the attempt to systematize education has driven all of this stuff that's hard to explain and even harder to defend. You know, it's driven it out of the system for most people. So they just don't ever encounter it, I guess. It's yeah. terribly sad.